There are so many amazing moments in season four of The Chosen, but this huge biblical moment won't be. Just after the events of season four, Jesus does something unbelievable, something that many people consider one of the strangest and most confusing passages in the Bible. And yet, it's a moment so important, it should concern us greatly. Check this out. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus leaves the place where he's staying in a town called Bethany and begins walking back to Jerusalem. So Mark tells us, seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Now don't miss those key phrases there. Mark makes sure to tell us that the fig tree not only has no fruit, but has nothing but leaves because this was not the season for figs. Now pay attention to those details. They will matter in a minute. And so after Jesus sees the situation with this tree, it appears that he's so frustrated that he curses the tree, declaring that it should never bear fruit again. And in a brief piece of side commentary, Mark lets us know that the disciples heard Jesus say this, because again, that will matter. So after Jesus leaves this fig tree, Mark then shares with us the second important event that occurs on this morning. Jesus enters the temple. And when he does, Jesus immediately starts driving out those who are buying and selling things in the temple courts. He overturns tables and chairs. He keeps people from carrying objects through the temple courts. He tells them that they've turned the temple into a den of thieves. And as we're reading this, all we can think is that this doesn't sound at all like Jesus. I mean, never before in Mark's gospel has Jesus been so angry. Never has he once done anything like this. I mean, is he just really mad about the figs? Does somebody need to get him a Snickers? Or is there something much bigger going on here? And this is where we all really need to start paying attention. This is where we begin to realize why this killing of the fig tree matters so much. Because all of this is connected. And in order to see those connections, you need to know something about temples and something about figs. But first, if you love learning insights about The Chosen and want to see connections to the show and the Bible that will transform the way you watch it, then click on the link above and down in the description and download my free resource called Seven Biblical Secrets Hidden in The Chosen. This will show you connections to scripture and the first century world of Jesus that are present in the show, but most people don't notice. We've actually packed a whole lot of information into a really small package, just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive back in. So when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, Mark tells us that he enters the temple courts. And this is a simplified version of what the temple in Jerusalem looked like at the time of Jesus. Now, if you look closely, what you can see is that it's designed as a series of spaces that take you closer and closer to God's presence. The most intimate and holy space was in this building. It was called the Holy of Holies. And this is where the presence of God rested. Outside of that, you have the priest's court, the court of Israel, and various other courts where Jewish people could go. But outside of all of that, you had the court of the Gentiles. And if you weren't Jewish, this was the only place where you could go. Now, judging by the size of this picture, you'd think that this was a really, really large space, and it was large. But when religious holidays came around, it was packed. You see, during religious festivals, this outer section was where all the vendors set up their tables, where they sold livestock and other things that could be used for sacrifices. It's where money changers would sit to exchange other currencies for the temple's special currency. And just to give you an idea of how packed it was, a historian named Josephus tells us that one Passover week, 255,000 lambs were bought, sold, and sacrificed in this area. A quarter of a million. I mean, this is what Jesus and his disciples see when they enter the temple grounds. And Mark tells us that as soon as Jesus gets here, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. In other words, Jesus flips out, literally. Now, the question we should be asking here is why? And our natural inclination is to ask, why did he flip all of the tables? But before that, we actually have to ask another question. We have to ask, why did he turn the tables over here? And it's actually the answer to that question that helps us to understand everything else going on here. You see, like we said, this space, the court of the Gentiles, this was the one place where Gentiles could go. This is as close as they could get to the presence of God. This is the only place where they can worship. 
So not only are they clearly not part of this community of faith, just based on the restrictions surrounding where they can go in the temple, but even in the place where they can go, where they are allowed, they're kept from worshiping. This place of worship has been turned into a market of chaos. And this makes Jesus furious. Throughout his ministry, Jesus is consistently reaching out to Gentiles and opening the door for them to be a part of God's kingdom. So when he sees what's going on in the temple, how overtly and obnoxiously Gentiles are being excluded, Jesus blows up. He starts destroying the things that are keeping Gentiles from worshiping. And then something really interesting happens. Then Jesus returns to the fig tree. Now, remember what happened the first time Jesus passed this tree? It says that he was hungry and he saw that it had no fruit. It only had leaves. Now to us, those are just tiny details. But to people listening back then, to the people who lived around fig trees, grew fig trees, relied upon fig trees, they see what's happening. You see, Middle Eastern fig trees bore two kinds of fruit. Nodules came in the spring and they were abundant and good to eat. And if you had lots of nodules, then you'd have a large harvest of the second fruit, the fig. But remember what Mark told us? He said it wasn't the season for figs and that the branches had had nothing but leaves. In other words, there were leaves, but no nodules, which meant that there would be no fig harvest, which meant that something was wrong with this tree. It was sick and it couldn't do what it was supposed to do, which is why Jesus curses the tree. He's basically saying this tree is sick, but there's more. Because if you were one of Jesus' disciples, then all of a sudden, these pieces are rapidly coming together in your mind. You would remember that the fig tree bore no fruit. You'd be thinking about what you just encountered in the temple with the leaders of the Israelite people. And then there would be this other part of you that remembers that scripture refers to Israel as a fig tree. After which the final piece would land, a scripture you heard growing up that you realize is coming true before your very eyes, literally right in front of you. Because suddenly Jeremiah 8, 13 pops into your head and you remember what God said. God said, I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the tree and their leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. And you realize that that is this. Jesus didn't just randomly kill a fig tree. This whole thing, the fig tree, then the temple, then the fig tree again. All of this connects to something much bigger. You see, what they're realizing is that the fig tree represents the Israelite people, specifically the religious leaders. They're getting in the way of the kingdom. They think that the only ones who can and will be saved, they think that salvation is exclusive to them because they follow the law and observe the oral traditions. They think that just being a part of the Israelite people makes them more worthy than others. But Jesus says that there is something wrong with them. They look good on the outside, but they aren't producing fruit. Something is wrong with them on the inside, and God is extending the promise beyond the Israelite people. God's promise, something that the Israelite people believe belonged just to them, is being extended beyond the Israelites. And here's why we should still be concerned about this message today. The reason that Jesus is so frustrated with the people he sees in the temple is because they were God's hope for the world. God looked at Abraham and said, through your offspring, all nations will be blessed. In Isaiah, God says, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will show my glory. Their purpose as the people of God was to be wholly devoted to revealing God's glory to the world, not just believing in it themselves, but revealing it to everyone. This was to be their identity. Their whole life told the story of who God is and God's plan for the world. But they stopped. They closed off the community. Rather than revealing God to the world so that all might worship God, they focused simply on their own worship, on their own relationship with God, on building relationships with one another and never looking out. And 2,000 years later, we have to keep asking ourselves the same question. Have we become dead fig trees. Well, that's it for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before you go, if you haven't done it yet, click the link above and down in the description and download my free resource called Seven Biblical Secrets Hidden in the Chosen. And if you'd like to see even more videos breaking down episodes of The Chosen, then just click this link right here. 
Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.